Hello, uh, I'm John Grant uh, and welcome to the first in a series of recordings the Wardley Mapping Community will be making during the run-up to Map Camp London 2019 that will take place in October. Um, I should mention that at the time of recording, the early bird tickets went on sale yesterday, I believe, or shortly before. Uh, we don't want anybody to be disappointed. Uh, judging by the last two years, the tickets do sell quickly. So my advice would be grab yourself a ticket as soon as possible. Um, so before I introduce today's guest, I'm delighted to say I'm joined by Ben Mosier. Um, some will already recognize Ben. He's very active in the Wardley Maps community. But for the benefit of those who don't know Ben, uh, say a quick hello and introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ben Mosier, and I run a little website at uh, you may or may not have heard of called Hired Thought. And I love helping people learn about Wardley mapping for the first time. That's a little bit about what I do. So, um, talking about map camps, Ben, uh, you're helping organize the inaugural map camp in the US, uh, in Atlanta, yeah. which is, I've got my suitcase on order. So it's, it's two <laughs> weeks, two weeks tomorrow. Um, so how are the preparations going for map camp Atlanta? There, there's sometimes, uh, just, just the way these sort of things kind of happen, um, you get them to a certain point and then they kind of have to coast and you're just looking to make sure that nothing goes off the rails. Um, this, this is an exciting one because uh, it's sort of the brainchild of, of Chris Corriere and it's a three track event featuring DevOps days, serverless days and map camp. And we're hoping basically to get everyone in the same room, have some interesting conversations. And I'm really excited to see how this is going to turn out. Uh, not to mention it's at the Georgia Aquarium, so <laughs> can't can't lose. Yeah, I'm looking forward to, uh, I believe it's the largest aquarium in the world, as far as I know. <laughs> um, so I've been busy over the last uh, fortnight or so, um, and what I tend to do is keep an eye on your Twitter stream, Ben. Keep me up to date on what's happening, all things Wardley Maps. So to save you a bit of time, uh, is there anything I've not picked up on, say, over the last two weeks? Is there anything that's caught your eye? Well, I don't want to, to ruin the introduction of our, of our guest, but I, I think there have been even more explorations of alternate forms of mapping that are happening out there. Um, might be an interesting segue. <laughs> uh, so, uh, it's time to introduce our guest. Um, I first met him at the um, Snowden Wardley Masterclass that was at the end of last year in Reading. And I also bumped into him at uh, Agile Scotland in Edinburgh the other week where he was giving a talk. So uh, welcome, Ben Shaw. Um, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your background. Hi, I'm Seb Shaw. Um, my background is largely in delivery. I've been working for um, automotive brands for the last seven or eight years. Prior to that, I've done some e-commerce and some local government and some other bits and pieces. I, yeah, I'm currently based in Gothenburg in Sweden. Uh, working for a company called AKQA and working with a couple of clients on digital transformation work. Cool. So it's, we're here to talk about Wardley Maps, so mm. let's get stuck in. Now, one of the main motivators for me to do this is to hear people's uh, backstory or their journey into Wardley Maps, where they first discovered it, um, any of those moments, those aha moments, or when the penny kind of drops and you realized actually this is 
going to be a useful framework either in my current job role or in my career. And I think there's a, there's a, there is a general assumption out there that we're not going to see um, case studies in the wild, uh, not for a few years. And I think, you know, to take the risk away is to actually engage with people and talk to them. Mm. So is there anything that you can share with us on that? Yeah. So I first found out about Wadley mapping probably August last year. Um, I was, as most people do, doing explorations and research into uh, topics that were relevant for the work I was doing. And more or less at the same time, myself and one of my colleagues came across both Kinefin and Wadley mapping, which looked quite interesting. We started, um, we started reading more about that, seeing how it might apply. And I remember one session where we got together with an agile coach we've been working with. Uh, we booked a meeting room for the afternoon and we decided we'd try our hand at Wardley mapping. So we put all the whiteboard paper up on the walls. We started scribbling down and um, we had a number of challenges when we were doing that. And looking back, uh, we weren't so much doing a Wardley map as we were putting an architecture diagram into um, a Wardley backgrounded uh, template. So there are, there are a number of challenges. I think we haven't got the sophistication or the understanding to really uh, take any further. Uh, but we saw that there was use there, but that I think we were on some level aware that we hadn't really done quite what we're supposed to. And then we are sort of going back and forwards on it for a while. And then I saw that um, Simon was talking at um, Map Camp in Scotland as part of the Agile Scotland uh, setup. And I mean, the tickets are fantastically priced. It's a really open and um, an inviting conference. So uh, I jumped on a plane, flew across uh, on the one um, direct flight that Gothenburg has to Edinburgh uh, every week and attended Map Camp in Scotland. So I think sitting and listening to, particularly hearing uh, Crossing the River by Feeling the Stones, getting some of the workshop opportunities through the uh, mapping stream and just getting a bit more of a context really helped me understand where we've been doing um, things properly and where we've been doing things perhaps less properly um, and have missed some of the nuance, some of the subtlety of that. And what was quite nice is more or less at the same time, I was exploring opportunities as to how to spend my training budget for the year as it was December uh, and I hadn't really done a great deal with it. And the mapping masterclass came up and I think the opportunity to spend two days listening to both Simon and uh, Dave Snowden talking about how these two approaches complement each other, how they can be applied differently and to really get into the detail of all of this was something that I thought would be hugely useful for the kind of work I was doing. So I signed up for that, uh, went along to Reading, it was a beautiful venue and I got a huge amount out of it. And as you mentioned, that was where we met. And I think taking part in that really deepened my understanding of how both of these things were. And you mentioned aha moments. And for me, one of the big aha moments in that session was uh, when the question was asked, which of the two approaches is more granular, which is the one you apply for, you know, that level of detail and which is the broader piece. And I think in my head, um, I had them backwards. I'd always kind of assume that, um, that Kinefin was the more granular of the two. Uh, and actually both of them agreed without really discussing or thinking that it for them was self-evident that Wardley was the more granular of the two. Uh, and Wardley was how you made those, you know, you looked at those more detailed individual things and that Kinefin was much more about the domains and about that bigger picture. So for me, that sort of flipped things on my head a little bit and made me think a lot more in depth around where the appropriate time is to apply this, uh, each of those, uh, those method, methods. So yeah, that was, uh, that was kind of the tail end of the year. Uh, by that point, I was quite invested in uh, the whole process. I was making everyone a bit fed up with me, uh, talking about it an awful lot at work, um, talking about it at home a fair bit, uh, generally just annoying people by going, well, we should think about mapping this. We could get some really interesting perspectives if we, uh, if we did that. Um, and 
I actually, um, as part of this whole process, volunteered to talk at Map Camp, well, at Agile Scotland in March, as you touched on. And because at the end of the Map Camp session in December, uh, they were asking for people who had you know, just got into mapping, uh, were learning and had attended to volunteer to do a talk. And I thought, well, that describes me to a T. This is um, also, it will give me that ongoing impetus to keep looking into this and to keep applying it. Because if I've got to uh, talk to a room full of people about what I've learned and how I've done things, I can't just sit on my laurels having attended the masterclass in December going, yeah, that was great. I need to actually have some actual outcomes that um, have followed through on that, that I can talk about. Um, so yeah, the three months between, um, uh, between the sessions in December and in March, I was doing quite a lot of um, mapping at work. I was taking people through it, uh, but also I started actually using it for weight loss. And this was kind of the topic of my, or the central theme of my talk um, was how by thinking about Wardley in terms of how it relates to weight loss and how the different elements of Genesis custom build uh, product and commodity map to different kinds of preparation of food, whether that's um, cooking from scratch at home, uh, going to restaurants, eating, you know, uh, what are essentially commodities like Big Macs or Starbucks lattes and how you can apply different or how you need to apply different measures to each of those to understand, you know, what the calorie counts are, uh, how you can record them and things for me was quite a useful way of thinking about Wardley mapping in a way that um, just highlighted how those different contexts between the different um, areas give you something to discuss with the people involved. So you can, I then sort of was applying that thinking to uh, to work and how people are operating in you know, a custom build domain, but maybe they should be looking more towards the commodity, you know, they're custom building things that already exist, how you can use those different contexts to, um, to help to help encourage people to move in that direction as opposed to just sort of flat out telling them they're wrong. Fantastic. That's a good introduction. And this, you, you may not be at the stage yet in your journey, but I'm just going to group together a couple of, a few questions mm. just to see, you know, to gauge your opinion and to kind of get some feedback that we can put there as a, for the collective to consider at the same time. So have you encountered any limitations to the, the framework? And I would also link that to any kind of pushback from your colleagues. Um, I mean, the, the word that's used in mapping is inertia, but yeah. that kind of thing. And I think it's interesting listening to you is how you've, you've come at this from both Wardley and Kenefin, mm. both at the same time. It's a, a learning journey both together. So we could bring in Kenefin here, it, it is relevant, but have you come across any limitations with either? Um, and so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Have you got any thoughts on, on those? Mm, I'm not sure if I'd use the term limitations so much as one of the, uh, one of the challenges I found is it can be hard to talk about both Wardley and Kenefin without it coming across as quite academic or theoretical. And whilst it's actually, you know, particularly uh, Wardley mapping is quite practical. Um, when you start talking about it, there's an element of you need to go into the detail of, um, of some of the limitations with strategic thinking or with, um, uh, with how people are currently operating or with you know business value and how people perceive that and it can be quite challenging to um, and to position it as as a tool something like impact mapping or uh, user journey mapping is very simple uh, to just kind of chuck up on a wall and people sort of instantly get it and there are examples with Wardley that I found people really understand but when you start applying it to their business um, I found that quite challenging to get people to um, uh, to understand it in that in quite that same way and to see the initial value. That's not everyone. As a number of people I work with, where it is, um, they immediately or very quickly kind of jump on board with it. But I think there is a certain there can be a certain resistance to something that can be seen as quite theoretical or quite academic rather than um, purely practical. Okay. 
Yeah, that's something that I think a lot of people encounter when they start mapping for the first time. And uh, one of the sort of weird things I've noticed is that there's this whole set of kind of prerequisite skills that need to be built for people to feel comfortable with mapping. Um, it, one of those skills is that of creating ontology uh, and really feeling comfortable scoping something mm. at the right level of granularity. Have you noticed any tricks or any sort of secrets uh, in your journeys towards finding the right answers to help people get started? I think one of the things that's been really helpful, um, one of the things I've do as part of my role is I run a training course on product discovery and uh, some of the mechanisms for that. And I've started incorporating Kinefin and Wardley into those at quite a high level. But one of the things that I think people understand quite quickly is the tea room example. Um, once you sort of put that up and you take them through, you very quickly get people asking, why are they custom building their kettles? Why, why is that a thing? Um, and then being able to sort of take people through that and then, uh, start talking about how that might apply to their own business does help. Um, so I think giving quite a simple example that anyone can sort of map through helps, but I think it is quite challenging, particularly um, as you can end up with an awful lot, awful lot of linking chains when you start mapping out people's organizations, particularly in my case, quite early into uh, my mapping journey, not necessarily having that sophistication to be able to um, filter out some of the uh, some of the noise to to focus purely on the uh, on the core elements. I think that can be quite difficult because you can end up with a map that's incredibly difficult to read. And where you're at today, if you are having a mapping session at work, how does what does that look like? Do you use a whiteboard? Do you use post-it notes, or do you use some kind of software tool to do that? Um, a bit of a mixture. When I'm mapping with other people, uh, I tend to use whiteboard paper, post-it notes, um, pens, as you'd expect, and uh, partly so you can move things around a little bit more easily with the post-it notes um, and sort of push them through. Uh, I've also, I did actually pull together, I've got a thing called a Remarkable tablet, uh, which is a sketching and writing tablet. And I've created a couple of backgrounds for that uh, templates, one of which is Wardley mapping, one of which is Kinefin which are available on the wiki if anyone's interested in them, uh, because it is, I, I find it quite easy to sketch them out. I've literally, as of last Friday, started playing around with one of the online tools uh, that's been put out there for orderly mapping, which is, um, which is quite nice, where you just sort of describe in the left-hand column what it is you're doing there. But I think at the moment, the sketching still feels quite natural, and being able to put it up on a big whiteboard is really helpful. So I think for me at the moment, that's my primary usage. It's more when it's something a bit smaller, I might sketch it out. I keep hearing about people recommending the Remarkable tablet. And I think just the other day, I think I saw a picture of Simon using one uh, to sketch out a map. Uh, I, man, I, I think it might be an interesting thing to sort of know uh, what the future of sort of personal kind of uh, sketching and morally mapping and sort of things like that, just having something to carry around with it that you can share with people. Mm. It's a really cool idea. Um, so if you're, if you're doing tea room examples and you're uh, often using the whiteboarding and you're basically trying to avoid getting too granular so that things get too, don't get too complicated. Um, are there any other sort of like obstacles that you run into as you're, as you're working through the concepts? Like evolution is a tricky thing. Um, yeah. What's that like for you when you explain that to others? I think generally people have got a fairly good, I think Genesis people struggle with, uh, but I think in a lot of areas, Genesis is rare. Um, custom build people get, commodity people get, um, and I think that middle point of product is where a lot of the discussion happens as to how much is a product uh, versus you know, how many, where does it sit? Is it a is it a product tending towards a commodity? Is it a product tending towards um, a custom build? Is it a product where there's a custom build layer on top? And I think, but those discussions are healthy. And I think that's one of the value pieces of value here is, um, is encouraging those discussions and kind of opening them out to the wider business. I think that kind of thing has been very dominated by technology, by IT teams and development and sysops and DevOps and in dev secops or uh, whatever the new name is that Simon's pushing for. And 
this opens it out, this sort of mapping gives you people the context to be able to start asking those questions. It allows finance or HR or project management or client service to go, I'm sorry, could someone explain why we're testing building kettles? Maybe it's fine, but if you could explain that, that'd be great. And I think that conversation um, is valuable. Okay, I'm going to just change direction slightly. And this is a question to both of you. Mm. Um, I think you've probably reached a stage now where you may be involved with recruitment or shortlisting or reviewing CVs or resumes. And let's just keep things general. Um, of knowledge workers but can any of you reflect on what you'd think if you saw experience of wardly mapping on a CV what would what would your impressions be and what would you say to your uh, teammates about that Seb I'll let you go first because okay. I'm gonna have to think yeah. about this one. <laughs> I mean I recruit off uh, across a range of roles, so I think there'll be a there'll be an element of which role am I looking for. Uh, but I think in any of them, if I saw that, it would certainly be something positive. It'd be something I'd be like, okay, so this is this is someone who's obviously keeping up with some of the new changes, some of the new techniques and things. And it would also be something I'd want to challenge in the interview um, and get a bit more depth on. So I think one of the uh, one of the dangers, as you all know, with any kind of recruitment, is um, you know, the buzzwordification. I interviewed someone once who had three pages of uh, technical skills, just bullet points of technical skill after technical skill after technical skill. And when I spoke to him about it, he was like, yeah, yeah, I'm not technical. They're just all the things I've heard of. Is there anything that springs to mind that you would challenge somebody uh, during it? Not challenge is the wrong word, but say, you know, you would ask them about worldly maps. You know, it's often the problem that you're dealing with at the time, isn't it? But Mm. Is there anything, would it be uh, gameplay or climactic patterns or doctrine? I think I'd probably start by asking them to, you know, saying that I've noticed they've got experience with it. Can you give me some examples of, um, of how they've used it? Yeah. And let them talk through uh, how it's appropriate because I think a lot of this is going to be so conditional on people's opportunity as well as their experience. You know, they might be aware of doctrine but have no ability to influence or use it. Um, and so they might be purely focused on the mapping. They might, you know, they might have been operating a level where they can apply gameplay. Um, so getting an opportunity to just let them um, talk through where it is. And again, that would very much depend on the roles we're recruiting for. It's almost what we're doing today. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah, a little bit. Do you want to say anything on that, Ben? Yeah, I was, I was thinking about how I would think through that, um, I, I've been fortunate enough to be in the circumstance where I was uh, providing input on the hiring decisions and uh, same, same kind of problems we would run into that you were describing, uh, Seb, where people would kind of litter their resumes with buzzwords or the right kind of things that look quite the right way. And, and as soon as you have a conversation with them, uh, it, it quickly gets a little bit sticky because you don't quite know what's happening. Um, we did some experimentation around practical exercises like hey, let's hang out for a little bit and talk me through how you would think through this kind of problem. Uh, so I think that approach would probably uh, remain much the same where like, hey, like you've got this, you've got some experience in wordly mapping. Tell me, um, like, let's, let's talk about this problem right here. And, and I know that this may be, <laughs> we're reaching for the one hammer in the toolbox that we seem to both be looking, uh, thinking about right now. But uh, could, we, could we use this hammer on this problem real quick and just sort of see how this, this plays out? Mm. Um, one thing I want to be careful about, though, is um, because we all know the method, I think our bias is towards people who, who want to think that way. And there's, uh, there's kind of like a, a dichotomy in play here where there's like a classic romantic split. Uh, if you've ever read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, uh, the, it's a great book, by the way, something I absolutely recommend. There's this notion of sort of classical uh, reductionist kind of views of the world. And I think that's kind of the way worldly mapping skews. Um, and and I, have, I have some thoughts on that uh, perhaps for another time, but basically taking a system apart into its component parts uh, as if it's a machine. 
Mm. And that is a very helpful frame. I think that's going to be the dominant frame of people who are just learning about worthy mapping. Uh, it's certainly the dominant frame for me as I've been going through it. Uh, but there's, I think the reason it pairs really nicely with something like Kinevin is that you have to acknowledge this sort of uh, wibbliness of complexity and, and unpredictability. Like, so instead of thinking of it like a machine, think of it more as like a black hole in a box and you just open it up and like some stuff is happening in there that you can't explain. Um, it, so having that kind of paradox of being super willing to take things apart into their components and then think about things that way as a frame that you're constructing versus just acknowledging that not everybody thinks that way. Uh, and in fact, it's really yeah. helpful to have people who don't think that way mm -hmm. so they can come at it from the other side of the paradox. So I'm, I would go in balancing those two kind of uh, paradoxical kind of perspectives, I think. I think that's a really good point that Ben, and it's something that we could as a community really explore. Uh, it needs more thought, but I'm glad that you brought that up. And I think maybe we should talk to Chris Daniels and get wibbliness put into the Wardley mapping glossary. <laughs> <laughs> so it will be a life goal. <laughs> before we wrap things up, um, let's look ahead. Uh, and this is a question for Seb, but you can jump in, Ben, is let's pick a time frame of the next 12 months. Mm. And really it's it's the learning you what how you're going to plan your uh next steps in either learning worldly mapping and applying it and um, what you could share and maybe if you've got any reflections from what you've said today for somebody that's starting out with worldly mapping uh, if anything springs to mind bring that up too yeah um so i think in terms of my development on this my biggest focus is uh, starting to add in the value or cost mapping through um, through the Wardley chain. So where is the budget flowing? Um, how does that apply? Because I think that additional level will really help sell in some of the um, the suggestions, some of the pressure we want to put on there as to uh, how you might want to change. So sort of being able to say, look, you are spending X amount of money to build your custom kettles as opposed to Y amount of money if you were buying them from a high street retailer. Um, These are the things that uh, you know, Simon talked to this capital flow is one aspect and the other is cost control, isn't it? Yeah. It's important. Okay. Yeah. Spend control. Spend okay. control. Thank you. Yeah. And I think having that, that's something that I've done at only a very superficial level so far. So that's something I'd really like to become a lot more proficient at um, outlining in there. And I think uh, that will add a lot of value to me. Um, and I think the other thing that I need to keep doing is always, uh, and this is kind of touching on what Ben was talking about, is always remember that you're in a complex space, that a map gives you, um, helps you understand new ways that you can uh, probe, sense, and respond to things. But it, as you said, it's not a machine. It's not something where if you look at the map and you look at the components and you go, if I push this uh, here, this will move on a fulcrum. It's like, no. If you push this, things will happen. What will happen? You need to probe, you need to sense, you need to respond and, and see how that goes through. So for me, always keeping that in my head that um, this is a complex domain you're operating in, that there are um, there is no best practice. There is no, if you do X, Y is definitely the result uh, is really important. In terms of recommendations to people starting out, uh, I think um, attending any local mapping sessions you can. For me, that was probably the biggest thing that um, that really helped shift my understanding and sort of make me leap forward and take this further was just attending some of these sessions, talking to people like yourselves, to Simon, to all the other attendees and really getting that, um, that context of how you can use it and that real practical detail of how this has been used elsewhere rather than uh, just kind of the theoretical, you're reading on the internet and you're trying to apply it to your own life and then kind of conversely to that is um don't limit yourself to uh trying to apply it just to the business you're operating in day to day the work you're doing every day because sometimes you can be quite close to it and it can be quite difficult to take that step back and i think that's where when i started applying it to weight loss that i started getting a better understanding is because i was applying it to something completely unrelated to my day-to-day -day job that was 
a bit separated out and it got me thinking about some of these things that I could then pull back into the more um, challenging areas that you know you work in in your day to day. So just giving that application. And then again, um, attending Chris McDermott's session on, um, on maturity mapping. So using sort of the similar framing, but applying it for, um, uh, for, well, for team maturity, for skill maturity, and how that can be shifted around. Again, all of those different perspectives help feed into that more, um, more fundamental understanding of what uh, Wardley mapping is trying to achieve. Good. Okay. So before we wrap up, um, how can people keep in touch with you, Seb? Um, social media? Do you have a blog? Yeah, so I, I'm on Twitter as at Sebastian J. Shaw uh, and also on Medium. So I published a few articles on there on a few topics. I decommissioned my blog because I hadn't written anything on it. Um, so I moved everything to Medium because it just seemed easier. And that's also at Sebastian J. Shaw. Okay. Well, thank you very much for taking the time uh, to join us on this initial uh, interview, uh, pre-Map Camp interview. Okay. Thanks to Ben for joining me today. So until next time, bye. Thank you. Thanks.